to the uh, 22nd meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. And uh, before we move to the first item, I remind those in the audience and uh, those around the table to switch your phones to silent. They can interfere with the broadcasting system. And you'll notice that some members of the committee are using tablets uh, for the purpose of reviewing their committee papers. We also have apologies from Graham Day and welcome Christian Allard uh, to the meeting this morning. And uh, the agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. First item today is to decide to take item three and four in private this morning, whether to consider our approach paper on the Scottish Government's forthcoming land reform bill in private at future meetings, subject to formal parliamentary referral. Are we agreed, members? We are. Thank you very much. In that case, we will move on to agenda item two. And uh, the second item is to take evidence on the proposed devolution of the Crown Estate assets from the Crown Estate personnel themselves. And we welcome this morning Gareth Baird, the Scottish Commissioner of the Crown Estate, Ronnie Quinn, Head of Ocean Energy and Energy and Infrastructure Lead in Scotland, Alan Laidlaw, the Rural and Coastal Portfolio Manager, and Rob Booth, the Head of uh, Legal Services. I think we'll just go straight into some questions just now, uh, because the ground is well trodden, I think, already. Um, the committee has heard largely positive endorsements relating to the role of the Crown Estate as landlords and leaseholders. But some stakeholders have expressed concerns about the transition. Can you tell us what you're doing to reassure your stakeholders at this time? You know, um, if I could t take that uh, from re reassuring our stakeholders, um, perhaps it would be best if I asked Ronnie on the energy and infrastructure side, and then I'll come to Alan on the rural side. Um, convener, thank you. The, the position is that um, we wrote to our uh, tenants, our main tenants, back in January, explained what the position was to them. We, I know that I've had a number of meetings with developers between now and then, the most recent of which was last week. Uh, we wrote out again at the start, end of last week, beginning of this week, I can't remember which now, um, just bringing people up to date. I've, on the back of that, set up further meetings going forward and had more telephone <laughs> conversations. So it, it's an evolving and an ongoing process just to uh, keep everyone advised as best we can uh, with the process so far. Uh, I'm sure Alan will have some comments to add from, from his side. As, as Ronnie says, we've, we've spoken to or written to all our tenants, and, and I think the key point at the moment is is that informal dialogue and, and interactions through different groups. All the liaison groups continue. So uh, we had the aquaculture liaison group uh, last week, and, and a really good opportunity to, to update on progress. I was at the Marine Cross Party Group last night, and there's quite a lot of discussion uh, about the, the process and the, the future there. Um, and I think the, the engagement we're doing at the moment is basically to inform that process to the people as who it matters, whether it be tenants and families on the rural estate or, or business operators elsewhere. So I think um, there's a lot of informal meetings and discussions, um, and a number of stakeholders and customers are coming forward to say, you know, there's important decisions that we've got to take in the future, and we need to know a direction of, of travel and a, and a steer, and we're trying to, you know, give as much clarity on that as we can. But referencing them back to, to the process. And, and I know, Convener, that some have picked up some issues with, with the committee and, and, and have corresponded with the committee as well. Indeed. Um, in particular, the committee has heard that investments in some of your rural estates are cross-subsidised by profits from other Crown Estate activities. Um, is this an accurate picture? And uh, how profitable are your rural estates in their own right? The... Um, <clears throat> It's, it's a basket of property assets than, that we manage and, and look after. Um, and like all sort of portfolios, there are ups and downs at different times and, and different uses. So I think it's a fair reflection to say that some estates have capital generation periods, um, whereas other estates have capital hungry periods for investment. 
a really clean example of that would be a number of years ago in 11-12 uh, when we had significant snowfall in Murray, massive amount of damage done to agricultural buildings. That resulted in a million pound bill for shed replacements in one quarter needing to be committed. Now, the Glenlivet estate would never be in a position to, to generate a million pounds in a quarter. Um, uh, so therefore, it, it was spread across the portfolio as it would be in, in that sort of position. So um, rural estates are, are capital uh, hungry at times, but equally change of land use creates capital and that is periodic. So sale of development plots and, and sale of land and things like that helps fund reinvestment into competitive agriculture, tourism or whatever we're doing. Um, so I think each different estate has its characteristics of, of capital requirements and costs. Um, and, and they'll all have different flows. So it's, it's quite difficult to take at one point an isolated position on, on one type of asset. Um, and again, the, co the coastal estate tends to generate a revenue more than capital because it's ongoing leases rather than sales and, or anything like that. Um, and, and they are able to help cover different parts of the business. So I think the, the fact that it is a portfolio, it's not all eggs in one basket and, and all the sort of analogies that the committee would understand, it spreads the risk and uh, allows for management decisions to be smooth, if you like. Well, indeed, are you able to reassure the committee that the level of your resourcing and investment in onshore and offshore assets will remain unaffected through the transition period? If I start on the onshore side to, to continue that side of things, um, you know, we have a statutory duty uh, under um, familiar territory to the committee in terms of uh, ag holdings and, and that side of things to make sure our assets are fit for purpose. And we're continuing to make sure that uh, all our safety liability obligations and things like that are, are um, carried out. What we're not able to do is start big long-term plans. So the Glenlivet mountain bike trail was a a seven-year project that we invested hundreds of thousands in. We're not able to kick off projects like that at the moment. But as I say, in terms of our sort of ongoing maintenance and, and safety liabilities, we're able to, to continue on that basis. I'll just say that from the um, renewable side, our, our budgeted spend for this coming year, this current financial year, uh, is, is in line and is probably a little bit higher than last year and the year before. So it's... Um, there's no slackening off in that. And there's no likelihood of that slackening off um, in the next year or two because transition in law usually takes longer than we would think it should do. But uh, even when acts are passed, the process <coughs> of secondary legislation takes sometimes a year or two to, to, to apply. Um, well, you'd be happy with that transition well, period. And so. we, we are actually hoping that this can be done as quickly as possible. Um, yeah for uh, as much for um, the sectors in which we work uh, as for the, the well-being and uh, peace of mind of the staff. Uh, but, um, you know, we can only really talk for this year. Um, the budgeted spend is, is in line with previous years. Good. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim Hume, you had a supplementary. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Uh, morning to everybody. Uh, just uh, the convener was asking about cross-subsidisation of, of profits within the Crown Estate activities. I'd be interested if you had figures at all, uh, if there was any cross um, subsidisation north t at, to the south of the border or south to the north of the border. I don't know if you have uh, sort of different uh, figures for national uh, profits. Yeah, our, our annual report will be issued next week on, on the latest financials and, and I know we'll send the committee a, a copy of that so that will give you as good an insight as we're able sort of in, in due course. Um, it's fair to say that at any one moment in time there will be different flows. The, the, the history of the Scottish assets would be in the last number of years in rural and coastal that there would be a, a net capital inflow to Scotland, an investment mm -hmm. um, rather than an outflow. Um, um, so that would probably be the, the, the most succinct way to summarise that over the last probably eight years. Mm -hmm. do, do we have a rough figure or a general? Yeah. It would be in the magnitude of uh, a couple of million a year mm -hmm. um, of, of inward investment, net of other uh, sales, disposals, etc. So mm -hmm. it has been an inflow of funds. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, Hume, I wonder if I could just give you a practical yeah. example of, of where that happened. As you know, I'm a tenant farmer myself, and my first visit up to Glenlivet uh, was after the, the huge snowfall that Alan referred to. And the thing that struck me about it was this, not least the, the huge um, pouring in of capital, but was that the facilities for the tenant farmers were not just replaced, but improved. So there was a real investment going into the state. And, um, you know, from my perspective as a, a farmer, it was great to see that. And it, it, it really reflects on the, um, you know, the power of a... a uh, a balance sheet well north of 10, million, 10 billion pounds, which and, and the various assets thro throughout that organisation that permits that at, at times uh, in, in a very short period, as Alan referred to earlier. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Dave. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Uh, just a wee follow up, uh, Alan, on, on that point. Uh, was that investment? merely to maintain assets or is it investment designed to generate future growth? Um, both. Um, uh, I think the, the example Gareth used is that um, there's a lot of, everyone knows in, in agricultural terms, there are a lot of uh, buildings and sets of fixed equipment that are beyond their you know, mm. useful life. Um, and uh, you know, uh, taking the simplistic view, you'd say there's a 20 square meter facility being lost, it will be replaced by a 20 square meter buyer that would be a fairly short-sighted view. So we've always taken the opportunities created by you know, change to, to look at that and say, actually, rather than replacing a redundant type of building, what could we do in partnership with the tenant and, and quite often with SRDP, et cetera, to lever in more yeah. to make the unit thor. And also there's investment in new enterprises uh, and things like that. So it'd be a mixture of both. Thank you. Okay. It's all long-term at this stage. Um, and just building on Alan's point, the, the actual figure for the last published accounts was a net investment of about £5 million. Uh, and the energy share of that, as, as you've picked up, is all long-term patient capital. <coughs> the sort of returns that you might be generating yes. five, ten years down the road <laughs> following that investment? Um, we, we would like that return to be, to be uh, made. Um, it, there are various models and various scenarios, um, and a lot depends on how the energy market and the offshore renewables market develops over the next few years. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the impact of electricity market reform and, and the CFD market. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of unknowns there and um, a, not, a lot of scenarios that we're working with and working through. But it's safe to say that we are a commercial organisation and we would be looking for a return on that further down the line. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to look at some of the economic assets at the moment then, and uh, Sarah Boyack has got a question first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, I want to pick up um, on the issue of um, whether you've discussed with HM Treasury the position of Fort Kinnaird. Um, I understand it's a major income generator, and we're wondering whether it's likely that that would be uh, devolved to Scottish ministers. Very happy to take that one. <clears throat> Uh, we have provided an ongoing support to Treasury in relation to ensuring that they are fully cited on what Fort Canard is as regards our indirect, indirect investment held by the ELP. Um, so we have provided them with the figures and the, the background information that they need in order to make informed decisions about how they treat Fort Canard and how UK government and Scottish government treat Fort Canard. Um, as far as whether, as at this point in time, under the um, legislation as has been published, Fort Canard would devolve, um, the answer to that is no. It's specifically excluded from the transfer of um, our functions to Scottish Government. And is there a, a, set, a, a paper which sets out the reasoning for that? Um, we have provided a... Well, we've provided Treasury with the background information to enable them to make a decision based on what Smith had said as to whether Fort Canard was in scope or out of scope under the Smith proposals. So was your view that it was within the scope of the Smith Commission? It just seems unusual to have a, a major piece of property that's actually here that wouldn't be transferred, which generates income. Uh, as a lawyer reading Smith, Smith talked about um, 
Crown Estate Economic Assets in Scotland being devolved to Scottish ministers. And there's a statutory definition in Section 1.1 of the Crown Estate Act which talks about what the Crown Estate is. And the Crown Estate is those assets as are managed by the Crown Estate Commissioners. At Fort Caned, the asset that is Fort Caned undoubtedly is an economic asset in Scotland, but we don't manage it. Um, the underlying asset isn't owned by the Crown, and therefore it doesn't, as a lawyer, to my mind, fit within the definition of a Crown Estate economic asset in Scotland as described by the Smith Report. Right, Mike Describe that as a bit churlish. I mean, you know, it, it may not be in or out of scope, but it's in Scotland. And doesn't it set a rather bad atmosphere that such an enormous and visible economic asset is in some sense the Scottish people are being told, no, 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 you're not getting hold of that? Doesn't that rather sour this process? I mean, I, I couldn't really comment in relation to the government's stance on it and what your constituents would think about that as a, as a proposition. But as far as the technical analysis of where Fort Caned as an asset sits within the devolution process... You're an official. Let me ask a commissioner. Do you not think this sours the process to have a situation where a, an obvious economic asset is being withheld from the process? Doesn't it seem like a bit of sleight of hand? Uh, I understand the tensions surrounding it, Mr Russell. Um, uh, they're, they're been very openly expressed, very clear um, what Robin and uh, his team have been asked to help inform the process is where the legal uh, structure sits, sits around this and it really will be for the two governments to, um, to negotiate it. I just want to make this point, and I accept the point of the governments, but I just want to make this point. We've been here before, and you remember we've been here before. We were here with Princess Street Gardens. Thanks. We were here with a, the grounds around Stirling Castle. And every time there is a question of assets being accrued to Scotland where they sit, there's always a but in it. And this is another but. And I do think it is a very unpleasant but, given its value. And I think the commissioners should think very carefully whether they really want to be put in the position of essentially looking as if they're being dogs in the manger. I mean, we understand that the partnership set up under um, English law uh, under the Limited Partnerships Act of 1907, uh, and therefore it's been dealt with as something which the Crown Estate as a whole has gone into a partnership with a private entity, an offshore one by the sounds of it, but anyway, a private entity. Nevertheless, the question is, if the assets in Scotland, do, do you think that uh, there might be the possibility of discussing uh, the retention of the profits made from that asset in Scotland in this country? Uh, from our perspective, that's very much a conversation between governments, so for Scottish government and UK government, to decide how they would wish to deal with those sorts of aspects. Um, in relation to, uh, I can talk to the structure of the English Limited Partnership if that would be helpful, um, but certainly it's a, a government issue in relation to the revenue. Okay. Well, we're not trying to put you as the uh, practitioners on the spot, but it's important to hear how you understand things from where you discuss these with the Treasury, etc. Yes. Um, next, some other assets. Chris Jong. Hello. Thank you very much, Governor, and good morning. Uh, some of the assets held by the Crown Estates in Scotland, uh, I'm, I'm told, have received less attention during the debate on this issue. Can you outline what work and associated resource goes into the management of your interest in Scotland's internal waters, uh, like salmon fishing, gold, silver, and other minerals? I'm quite particularly interested about gold. There's a gold rush just now. I know that in Ayrshire we found gold, and even in the northeast of Scotland, the region I represent, there's a, a gold rush in Towy in, in Aberdeenshire. So, you know, what kind of asset are we talking about? What, what the work are you doing? Um, the, yeah, you, the, the, the sort of uh, the assets that you talk about are probably the assets that actually get very little time spoken about. Um, people focus on renewables and offshore and focus on farms, but actually there are a number of asset classes such as the salmon fishings and gold that don't actually get a lot of attention. 
That's in the public view. They still get a lot of attention through my team um, and through our managing agents team. So um, nothing has changed in terms of the management of those assets for a number of years. We still manage them uh, on a national basis to make sure that they are um, sustainably worked if appropriate and to make sure that they are well looked after. Um, so in terms of active <coughs> gold interests, you've, you've touched on a, a couple of the areas. The most progressed gold interest in Scotland is, of course, at uh, Tindrum, uh, where there's an active uh, exploration um, and a planning consent being worked through with Loch Lomond and, and Trussex National Park and a developer who's interested in, in a commercial scale operation there. And that's really exciting. It's got you know, a lot of hoops to go through regulation wise, um, but it's a, an exciting opportunity and, and economically it's very strongly supported in that area. Um, where gold is a, a, a sort of non-economic asset, where it's a recreational asset, if you like, that can cause some other issues as well. And there's a, a member of my team um, working very, very hard on gold panning, recreational gold panning, working with SNH, Loch Lomond National Park and Police Scotland on some issues of, of uh, environmental damage and concern caused by recreational gold panning. Um, and when I say recreational gold panning, I don't mean a plastic pan sitting at, standing in a river on a sunny day. I'm talking about scuba gear and pumps and erosion of triple SIs and salmon beds and things like that. So you know, there's quite a conflict issue there. Um, and I can guarantee that there's a, a significant amount of effort and work goes into trying to manage that just quietly. Um, while there's very limited income from it, it's still an important national asset and needs to be, to be managed carefully. Um, and the same would go with the, the salmon fishings interests, the river salmon fishings interests. Again, a member of my team is working very hard on the Wild Fisheries Review, on the changes, the, the proposed changes to the boards, which I know all of you are familiar with. Um, and there's a lot of work going on there with the community associations that rent those, uh, at least those waters from us. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of difficult issues coming up from that, which tenants are, are nervous of and, and, and want some assistance with. So we're working very closely with them. So I think you're, you're right to say that they don't always get the headlines in terms of people understanding what's being done with them. But I can, I can assure the committee that you know, they are being looked after. Nothing has changed in, in terms of the, the period um, post-Smith. Um, and we'll continue to look after those assets and, until such times as the changes go through. Very important national asset. Uh I wonder, uh, you know, seeing some of the news, it looks like that uh, the people who are attending this asset who are working on them and making profit out of them are not always people from Scotland. Is it, is it a lot of... You know, when, when the uh, estate, uh, Crown Estate, identifies such, uh, such a such a possibility of, uh, of, of developing such assets, uh, does it look at people in Scotland, organisations in Scotland and companies in Scotland to, uh, to, to work on it or does it just sell it off? Oh, I would say in terms, of, in terms of salmon fishings, the vast majority are local associations, so local community groups leasing fishings off us and, and acting as a, a, a local custodian, uh, a, a, a real force for good in the rivers that they're operating in. Interest in gold probably splits between recreational um, and that's very much local. People tend to be in people coming into an area and spending money to, to, to be recreational. It has its issues. In terms of commercial scale gold development, um, the, let's say the UK market and appetite for investing in gold exploration is quite limited and therefore organisations, so one of our tenants is a Scottish uh, led organisation but has always found it difficult to receive capital and investment from the UK. So they've tended to go to countries where they're more familiar with uh, minerals, ex uh, sort of expo um, exploitation and, uh, and investments so of South Africa, Canada, Australia, where there's probably more of a, an appetite to, to get into that. So that's probably where quite a lot of the external interest comes. Um, but certainly the Tindrum development is very well supported locally because of the economic impact it will have locally, both on tourism and on, on, on jobs. And I'm conscious that there's people in the room that are far closer to that development than I am. So they would probably be able to okay. give you an update. Can, can you try to put some figures on, on, on this assets? You know, what kind of revenue are we talking about? Uh, the, the revenue side of the gold uh, interests in Scotland at the moment is very limited because there are no active um, uh, 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 agreements that are creating um, uh, income and, and we would receive a, a royalty based on output once that was up and running. 
Um, on the salmon fishing side of things, um, there's approximately £50,000 per annum received from um, salmon fishing's uh, interests. But again, when you put over the, the amount of work that's done um, with the team and the investment in time and, and that side of things, it's, uh, it, it's certainly not a, a big money um, spinner from that point of view. Okay. Um, Mike Russell. Yes. I mean, the problem with gold is, it's, um, if I may put it this way, a slow burn, is it not? I've been down the mine at Tyndrum. The discussions have been going on for many years. The mine is not capitalised as yet, and indeed has sought capital on several occasions. How do you make a longer-term thing of natural assets? And would the, the big issue for Scotland not to be not so much the, uh, the transfer of, of responsibilities, but the creation of a modern minerals act, which every other... Uh, European legislature appear now appears to have. I think we are we're very used to those long, slow burns. You don't invest in farming, forestry, minerals, or offshore energy without taking a very long-term view. And 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 uh, Ronnie used the, the phrase patient capital. We're we're very used to putting in patient capital and and all of the work that our team do with the sort of developments that you're talking about in, in terms of gold is about enabling that opportunity to be created. And it's exactly the same on the coastal estate, where um, you need activity, and I, I've said this before the committee before, that we need a symbiotic relationship with our tenants doing well for us to, to receive benefit and for that to, to flow around the system. Um, so I'm, I, I, in terms of a mineral act, I, I think there are lots of um, vagaries of historic positions on different types of minerals. and. Uh, you know, um, I will leave that to legislators to, to bring forward a, a change to the, the mineral sort of uh, um, legislation. Um, I think we are very well versed at, uh, and used to, to taking a patient view and helping things happen because we, we realise that um, how we set up our agreements and how we deal with companies will have a major impact on whether or not that happens or not. Uh, and I think that the, the, the Tyndrum example is a, a good example where we've worked very closely with the developer through a, a, a great deal of years um, to try and get it to fruition. Um, and we've taken a very long-term view on that. Thank you. Um, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning to you all. Uh, I've got one general question about investment uh, to follow on from other questions that have been explored this morning already, and one quite specific question which I'll come to um, if, through the convener, other members don't have further, <coughs> more broad questions about investment. Um, of course, there, we understand that, as a committee, that there's scope for the Crown Estate to continue their um, robust investment in Scotland. Um, but would you like to make any further comment, any of you, on what this investment might look like um, over future years? Me. Um, Crown State has got a fairly uh, focused set of uh, investment criteria. Um, tend to invest in areas where they can bring a, or it can bring a, a wealth of uh, knowledge and uh, critical mass. Those areas are prime regional retail parks, London's West End, uh, offshore wind, and rural and strategic land. That concentration of investment tends to be funded by the sale of other non-core assets and uh, the creation of a number of uh, limited strategic partnerships, uh, bringing in investment uh, both from the UK and overseas. No. Right. Um, through the convener, I'll, I'll, I'll just follow that up. Um, something that uh, has been raised through this committee before, um, when you've, when you've um, come before us in previous um, uh, years. Uh, is, is there any scope um, through the Smith Commission and le leading forward to um, the transfer of powers to explore the possibility of the responsibilities um, and the remit um, broadening to include um, economic development and social remit, um, as well as what, um, Ronnie, you've described already? And if I may, in relation to the new manager, so whichever body Scotland decides to take on Crown Estate functions mm. in Scotland, I, I can't see anything in the legislation that prevents Scotland from doing what it wants to as far as those sorts of more social enterprise focused activities. Um, you'll see within the um, 
with the UK government draft bill that Scotland is given power to legislate by order in council before the transfer date to set up those sorts of structures and then post the transfer date full legislative power to do as it wishes as far as those sorts of management based activities. Thank you. Yeah, I think it, you know, if it's also worth talking about um, the type of activity that Mr. Russell asked about and the, the slow burn, um, and then in particular the coastal and rural estates. You know, all of the activity that we look after uh, and we help and assist is all about enabling things to happen. Um, and our view is very clearly that the, the social and uh, economic factors in there are very, very important. So. Um, you know, uh, some of the committee members were at the, the Aquaculture Awards the other day and, and heard a lot about the, the aquaculture industry and, and indeed our annual report last year covered a huge amount of upstream and downstream benefits from aquaculture operating in, in certain areas. And I know the committee have looked quite considerably at the, the sort of salmon industry um, and there's a lot going on there. I think if, uh, if you also look at the investments that we've completed and the work that we've done with communities on marine leisure, you know, there's an important debate yesterday in, in the chamber about marine leisure um, and some great figures coming forward about the, the opportunity. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, Stuart McMillan and Fergus Ewing have both been heavily involved in that. Um, we were talking to one of our uh, operators on a community group yesterday um, on the Western Isles and said that the direct capital investment that we made a couple of years ago has made a, a thousand pounds uh, a week difference to the income of the local shop. Um, the hotel is uh, doing far, far better. And, and I think, you know, even within the current mandate that we have, that people have criticised in the past, that there is a huge amount of socio-economic benefit that flows from the areas that we operate in and the work that we, we undertake. Um, but again, Rob's been very clear that there's a, an opportunity to, for that to be looked at going forward as well. Thank you. And uh, quite a specific uh, question as well, um, which is complex, and I hope I've, I understand it um, right. Uh, the, the, we're seeking clarification um, on the process um, as, as, as we move forward in relation to the Smith Commission and leading to the Scotland Bill. Um, and what is your understanding um, in relation to the transfer of powers and assets? Because there have been some concerns raised, raised with us as a committee and expressed that because the, um, the Crown Estates Act of 1961 um, is not to be repealed as it, as it um, relates to Scotland, um, that all income will have to be paid to the Scottish Consolidated Fund even if local communities or indeed local authorities um, are um, receiving the income and had control of assets. And if this is the case, do you see scope for change in this? I hope I'm, uh, I'm yeah, portraying this You've expressed it very well. Um, in relation to the position post the transfer date, mm. um, the 1961 Act, so the Crown State Act 1961, is applied effectively as a fallback to fill a potential vacuum mm -hmm. uh, as at the transfer date if no Scottish legislation has been brought forward to set up the structure that effectively will, will take on the, that, that new role mm -hmm. then a modified version of the Crown Estate Act is applied effectively just as an interim measure until Scotland has had an mm -hmm. opportunity to, to pass that piece of legislation. So there isn't in my reading of the bill, an anticipation of an ongoing application of those 1961 Act principles to management in Scotland. And the 1961 Act, post the transfer date, as it stands at the moment, will only apply to the Crown Estate in the rest of, Scot um, rest of the UK. So Scotland has, has freedom as far as that particular aspect is concerned. In relation to the consolidated fund point, I think there is an amendment in the existing um, UK legislation that says that Crown Estate revenues, as they would have been characterised in Scotland, would mm. flow to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. A matter for government as to whether that really works for them as far as delivering what Smith has asked for, and I, I won't presume to comment in relation to that. Mm -hmm. and, and through the convener, are there other um, members of the panel who wish to comment on it at all? No. No. Right. Mike Russell? Yes, sorry. You said in your reading of the Scotland Act this was a, um, a temporary measure until legislation is in force. 
I have Clause 31 of the Scotland Act in front of me. Can you point me to where that is implied or stated? <clears throat> so there are, there, are, there are two points to note. The first is that within the new 90B that's inserted into the Scotland Act, there is a power at subsection... Let me just check. It's subsection 6 of clause 31, which talks about provision being made by ordering council um, for the... Oh, sorry. So it's subsection 7, apologies, um, which talks about Her Majesty by ordering council, so effectively on behalf of Scottish Government, being able to pass um, a, a, a secondary piece of legislation ahead of the transfer date to ensure that the infrastructure has been set up the other point to So you, you have to direct me to this. I'm looking for exactly where that is. Um, I'm on so Clause 31. So it's Clause 31, subsection 7, um, which says Her Majesty may, by ordering council, make such provision as she considers appropriate for in connection with the exercise of the transferee under the scheme under Section 90. OK, now I see it, right. So that effectively allows Scottish Government to pass... Yeah, it doesn't really ahead. imply it's going to happen, does it? It allows it. I mean, I think it is really important that we understand what's happening here. And with your permission, convener, can I just probe this a little? Because I do think it is very important, and now it's been raised by uh, Claudia Beamish. I think we need to, to treat it very seriously. You see, um, essentially what we've got here is the transfer of a function. What is the function of the Crown Estate that's being transferred? Can you tell me that? It's the management of the Crown Estate itself. Well, well, can you just express it as it ex is expressed in the Crown Estate Act 1961? Because it's quite important to understand this. Because it's only one thing that's being transferred here, isn't it? That's just one thing uh, that's being transferred. Because there is one function of the Crown Estate in, in paragraph 1.1 1 .1 of the 1961 Act. Which right? is, is managing and turning to account the Crown Estate. It, it is indeed. With the function of managing and turning to account land and other property rights and interests and of holding such property, well, the holding doesn't count here. So, in those circumstances, that's the only thing that's being transferred. The functions of the commissioners, that's the core function. There are other activities, powers, restrictions and obligations in the Act that will transfer at the same time. But, yes, you're right. The, the core function is the managing and turning to account of Crown land. Okay, so... That gets transferred, that is then transferred. But then the uh, Clause 31 uh, says that essentially what will happen is that the functions of the 1961 Act will apply to Scotland now and to the actions of those who have taken over the functions of the Crown Estate. But that's not the case at the present moment. So if I have a small harbour in my constituency uh, which wants to invest in its own future, actually it will now have to abide by some very complex functions, including paying monies to the consolidated fund, that it never had to do before. I mean, let me ask you, as the Crown Estate in Scotland, why didn't you simply say, or did you say to the Treasurer and others, why don't we just say, there's a sign, we're putting it in our door, we're now out of business, the Scottish Government can take over a lock, stock and barrel and get on with it, instead of essentially uh, trying to tie up the matter in the detail of the 1961 Act, which would mean that not much had changed. Um, <clears throat> just addressing a, a few points in that, if I may. Once the transfer of functions has occurred under the statutory transfer scheme that's envisaged by the Scotland Bill, the assets that we're talking about will no longer form part of the Crown Estate because they aren't managed by the commissioners. So those assets will no longer be a reserved matter under the Scotland Act 1998 and Scotland, apologies, will have full, uh, a full ability to legislate in relation to those functions. So, in your analogy, it is open to them, I believe, um, to effectively have a complete refresh and move on with their new body on that front. The only underlying principle that I guess you could characterise as being a constraint is that we have to remember that those assets are owned by the sovereign in right of the Crown. And the fundamental founding principle of the Crown Estate and the transfer of those functions 
is that the underlying property and the capital that's generated from that property is not ours. The Crown Estate doesn't own it. It's owned by the sovereign, and that founding principle of the Crown Estate is, I believe, reflected in what UK government have sought to do in the bill as regards any constraints. Other than that, you, you have a power by ordering council ahead of the transfer date or by full legislation post the transfer date to effectively set the destiny for these assets for Scotland going forward. But you would accept that what we're seeing in the legislation as presently drafted and as before the House of Commons is a, essentially what is a, I think it could be well called a, a devolution, not a devolution of competence, but merely a transfer of function. Because as the legislation is presently stated, uh, if it were to come into effect tomorrow morning, then it would be more restrictive in Scotland uh, than it presently is, particularly upon those to whom the function is transferred. Um, once the transfer has occurred, the functions that we're talking about will no longer be a reserve matter under the Scotland Act. So uh, I'm not they're fully saying that. What I'm saying to you is, uh, as the clauses presently are, right, then if that transfer were to take place tomorrow or the week after or the week after that, then that transfer would result in something that is more restrictive than the present situation. The resulting position in your scenario would be as restrictive as it is at the moment, but I, I would just repeat the point that that will only come to pass to the extent that Scottish Government hasn't already passed legislation for the discharge of those functions in Scotland. That's the only scenario mm. where those 1961 Act provisions will apply to you. Mm. You will understand why some people regard this as over-complex and unnecessarily complex, and that there really should be simply a system that says, those are the assets, that's the management, it's handed over now, cheerio. I, I can't argue against it being complex. It is complex, but it's complex for a reason. And the reason is that the Crown Estate is complex. It isn't just a function. It's also a business, and it's land, and it's interaction with all of our customers. It has a staff who need to be protected as part of this process. And you know, reading this as a lawyer, again, what the UK-based legislation seeks to do is to put structure into the Scotland Bill in order to ensure that those very important interests are being protected, whether they be defence, whether they be oil and gas, whether they be our customers in Scotland and, frankly, our valuable and highly professional staff in the Bells Bray office. That's why it looks complicated. Nobody's criticising your staff, but your staff, Mr Booth, are one sentence of the Clause 31. They're not the burden of Clause 31. The burden of Clause 31 is, in my contention, the contention of many, over-complex, uh, seeks to perpetuate a, a situation which would be difficult and cumbersome to change, and it does require some very, very critical examination, uh, at which it's getting at the present moment. Thank you for that. Um, we will ask the government, both uh, the minister who's coming here, the cabinet secretary, and presumably in the Devolution Further Powers Committee, uh, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government, what their take on this particular point is, because it seems to be a moot point uh, from what we understand, uh, despite the explanations which you know, are absolutely lucid and to the point. Um, we need to move on at the moment, but I think we've, uh, we've dealt with that. First of all, uh, the transfer of management um, to Scottish ministers. We continue with the question on that from Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're all well aware uh, that the interests of the Crown Estate are complex, as has just been uh, mentioned. Um, so, are there any areas where you think particular work is required uh, by the Scottish Government, or indeed the Crown Estate, uh, to ensure a smooth transition of responsibilities? If I could start off, uh, Mr MacDonald, um, just by setting out what's happened so far uh, to, to do this transition. Um, from the Crown State's perspective, we've set up a, a project steering group and a working group. Uh, they've been established and are now meeting regularly. We've set up regular uh, meetings within uh, or between the Crown State and the representatives from uh, Scottish Government, and in particular Marine Scotland. Uh, 
we've appointed a, a programme manager, Roy Evans, and he's meeting with those officials. We have had a, a wider kick-off meeting uh, earlier on this year in March, uh, where we introduced to colleagues in Scottish Government, uh, we introduced to them the mechanics of running the portfolio. So we, we had a full day session where we, we, we went through that. We've uh, delivered drafts of heads of terms for our management transfer protocol, a transition MOU, outline briefing on how the Crown Estate manages, manages its assets in Scotland. Uh, we've set up a, a virtual data room. We've identified over 100,000 documents and records, hard copies, that will have to be physically transferred. Uh, we've identified an additional HR resource and we've appointed someone to work within Bellsbury to help us through this period. And we've also established protocols that will enable um, revenue from Scottish assets to be ring-fenced and identified uh, for uh, accounting and budgetary purposes going forward. So there's a fair bit of work and you know, this is an ongoing scenario. We met with officials last week of, of Scottish Government colleagues there and um, we're, we're working to make this as um, seamless as we possibly can, as I mentioned earlier before, for the benefit of the industries in which we work. The last thing we want is any hiatus or long drawn out process. There are some fairly crunchy decisions that will have to be taken by uh, our tenants uh, going forward and uh, we need to make sure that um, this transition, this transfer isn't on the critical path for anything. Okay, so are you confident it will be seamless or as seamless as We will try very possible. hard to make it as, as seamless as we possibly can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, move to the transfer of management to local authorities and others. Uh, Jim Hume, start. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Convener. Yes, just regarding the transfer of management to local authorities and, well, others being c communities, I just wonder uh, what issues you think uh, you consider as the advantages and, and disadvantages of uh, devolution to local authorities and communities. I want to be very clear that, um, that that's a political decision to be taken as to, to where mm -hmm. it goes to. I think you know, the committee took evidence from a number of, uh, of, of tenants and stakeholders in, and in two sessions the other week, um, and there's a number of local authority representatives there. We've got really good working relationships with the local authorities, um, and, and they all differ right across Scotland. There's 28 local authorities with coastal interests, and uh, you've had evidence from three or four of them. Um, some of them are very engaged in that process and, and others are not. So from our point of view, we need to make sure that for our customers that there's clarity on, on what's going to, to any, any further decisions about that and to make sure that we, there's still a strategic sort of understanding of the type of assets that we look after. Um, so I wouldn't want to comment on you know, future recommendations and, and comments that some people have made in terms of local um, further devolution. But I think we need to make sure we're clear about where that applies and how it's, how it's worked through. Um, and that's where quite a lot of um, uh, representations to, to us and, and to you, I think, um, are coming from, is to, to make sure there's clarity in that. And again, the, the Marine uh, uh, Recreation, Boating and Leisure Tourism cross-party group last night, that was quite a bit of interest to, uh, to try and establish where that was, where that was headed. But that, that's not necessarily a matter for us to, to mm -hmm. comment on. Is there anybody else? Or? Uh, 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 thanks for that, uh, Alan. But that, that was quite a very sort of high level sort of strategic and talking about clarity and, and all that sort of stuff. But I wonder if we could get down to more of the, the meat. Um, there will be political decisions made on further devolution. But if that further devolution happens, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it will in some form or, or another, I just wonder if you could identify some of the opportunities and threats really and uh, and some benefits that may have or disadvantages that may that may occur uh, mr hume i wonder if i could come in on a a, a scotland plc uh, viewpoint from this if you like again coming back to the food and drink industry um, the scottish food and drink industry has identified some searching targets over the next five years uh, which industry is determined to achieve Mm -hmm. And speaking personally, uh, as a primary producer of food, one of the great uh, pleasures I've had in my post is seeing the forward-looking attitude um, of the primary producers who are involved as Crown Estate tenants. And 
um, whatever structure is arrived at post-transfer, for, for me, speaking as, well, let's take my position as a director of Scotland Food and Drink, there's real concern about the primary production sector to be able to keep delivering to hit the Scottish food and drink uh, members' targets, which have been completely backed up by, by government and indeed supported uh, very, very heavily. A lot of that uh, production, if you like, the, the wherewithal to, to hit these figures depends on the quality primary production coming out of Scotland. And to do that, we need a forward-looking industry. I think the pleasure I've had in speaking to our tenant farmers uh, frequently is that they've had a landlord who, with them, are prepared to go forward, take risks, invest, and really move in a very forward, positive direction. My concern is that post-transfer, there's a structure there which allows these forward-looking people uh, businessmen and families, businessmen and women, to take that, to, to maintain that upward trajectory. And uh, I, again, it's for Scottish Government to determine which pathway that goes. But uh, around the food and drink industry, that's going to be of crucial importance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Dave Thompson? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> yeah, some of the evidence we, we heard uh, just the other week there was indicating that. Um, Certain functions would probably be better done Scotland-wide. There's certain aspects of what you do that uh, operate best at that level. Other functions might operate much better at a very uh, local level. And, and could you envisage uh, a system whereby both of these things could operate at the same time, some kind of hybrid situation, I suppose, is how I would call it, um, where certain of your, of your roles would be across uh, Scotland, but maybe there would be a, a, a presumption in favour of local management arrangements as well? Um, thank you, uh, Mr Thompson. The, the sort of position you talk about is quite similar to what happens at the moment, because, for example, for moorings, really local management of moorings is much better done at that local level. And we agree the sort of strategic boundaries that they operate within and, and then local committees and groups, you know, do that management. Again, with the work that we've been doing with local management agreements about communities taking forward projects and interests, again, that's at the most grassroots level to allow them to take things forward. At the same time, we support them in a sort of positioning in policy terms and, a, and in a connectivity terms. So the Marine Leisure Tourism is a, a really good example. Delivery on the ground from Small Development Trust. You had Elgar Finlay in here a few weeks ago mm -hmm. looking to do some really exciting projects uh, in Glendale there. Um, that is true local delivery, but we are working very closely with them to understand the connectivity to other projects at the strategic level. And we're involved in, the, in the, 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 the national research project on the marine tourism opportunity to make sure we can inform that back. So there's, there's quite a lot there at the moment. And, and I think that um, you know, in, in line with the Community Empowerment Bill, in line with the, all the direction of travel, all those sort of things, there will be more opportunities for communities to be involved in those activities and the structure that's put in place by Scottish Parliament, by Scottish Ministers to, to, to manage the assets that are the Crown Estate at the moment will have flexibility to, to do that as they wish. And I, I see that as, as an opportunity to make sure it, it works um, because we believe it works at the moment and we'd hate to see a loss of that. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question, but certainly um, there's a paper from Community Land Scotland written probably by a former <coughs> member of, of this committee who, who's looking at that side of things and, and talking about those sort of things. Mm -hmm. I think okay, Alec Ferguson you. would like to ask a question on the same area. Well, I, just, I, I was going to say, I, I don't know if it answers Dave Thompson's question, but it certainly answers mine, which is because that's exactly what I was going to ask. That could be so helpful. Just, no, not for the first time, Mr Thompson and I are thinking on the same lines. Um, <laughs> but, but I wonder, could I just expand on it a little bit, because you, um, uh, Alan, Laidlaw, you quite rightly mentioned the two stakeholder sessions we had here, and I have to say we were given a very positive um, view of the, 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 that stakeholders had of their relationship with the Crown Estate, and I think it would be fair to say that that positivity was based on two main 
two main reasons. One was the single entity that, that people could deal with in the Crown Estate, um, as opposed to the possibility of having to deal with a multiplicity of, of be it local authorities or other organisations. Um, and secondly was the level of expertise that is available through the Crown Estate. And I mean, just, just to expand on your answer to, to um, Dave Thompson, do, do, I, I pick up that you believe it is possible to devise a structure that would still be, be able to devolve a number of responsibilities to further down the chain, if I can put it that way, but still maintain that, that single entity that people like to work with, clearly, um, and, uh, and the expertise that goes with it. Is that sort of roughly what you were saying? Yes, and, and, and I think that, that, that you know, looking at things afresh, which would give an opportunity, is you know, it'd be great to pick up all the bits that work uh, and to make the bits that people have got more concerns about work better. That, that would be my simple approach is, is, is let's, let's benefit by this change and, and this process. It won't be simple, but I think yeah, with a bit of thought from people like yourselves who are engaged in, in the discussion and, and the communities and stakeholders, um, and, and I know there's been a discussion about public consultation and, and what have you, um, I think that would be eminently possible. <coughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, Mike that. Russell. Yeah, I think I think it's fair to reflect, as Alec has reflected, uh, Alec Ferguson has reflected, that uh, amongst, for example, the marine, uh, marine leisure stakeholders, uh, my own constituency, Tobermory Harbour Association, uh, amongst some of the agriculture stakeholders and others, there's been a strong response to any threat to the existing expertise and talent base of the Crown Estate in Scotland. Um, and they want to see that expertise and talent base uh, re retained. Uh, so I think that's a credit to the Crown Estate in Scotland that that's the case. But I think Secondly, uh, there is an issue about the appropriate level uh, for decisions to be made. And I think without, uh, without doubt and, and with unanimity in my own constituency, that level is not at local authority level. Uh, there may be a variety of good reasons in Argyll and Butte that why that's the case, but more widely, reasons of expertise. Reasons that, ex that, those ex that expertise does not exist mm -hmm. at local authority level. It does not exist in marine planning, for example, at that level. So I think certainly what I'd be looking for, and I'd be interested in your comments on this, is how you can build upon the success that you're beginning to have in devolving some of your activities to a lower level. Let's take Tobermory as an example, where although the deal is not done, you know, the discussion about the deal has been quite lengthy, uh, the possibility of a harbour association uh, using the powers of the Crown Estate uh, for, to benefit their own community and acting uh, essentially in place of the Crown Estate in that area uh, has been very uh, positive. The, pro the potential is good. How do you replicate that and how can you bring it forward a bit faster so that when this business is over and done with and these unnecessarily complex clauses have been sorted and resolved, uh, we might actually have something on the ground on which we can build? I wonder if I could take the, the overarching picture there, Mr Russell. Um, uh, much is talked about the Crown Estate assets in Scotland being passed ac across to Scottish ministers, and we will do everything we can to accelerate that process as transparently as we can. And in Alan's phrase, we will seek to have um, any involvement from the present team that on day two post-transfer the management of those estates is right up to speed and delivering for Scotland. Um, you've already heard from Alan and you know fine well in your constituency about uh, the success of these local management agreements, which I hope for the communities has been um, very beneficial. Certainly from our side, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to get the investment in there on a business-like transaction and seeing the, the immediate rewards that are coming towards that, uh, towards that community. Uh, how the management of, uh, of these assets are uh, devolved and then uh, engaged upon is very much a, a matter for Scottish ministers. Um, all I would say is I would repeat that we will seek to... Uh, progress that transfer as, as quick as we can. And the other point I'd just like to make, lots, lots is, uh, is talked about the, the, all the assets in, uh, in Scotland. The, there's another asset there, and have you, as you have already generously referred to it, is the team at Bellsbury and the expertise there. 
And my concern as very much a non-executive member uh, of the Crown Estate is to see that the transfer of that expertise, experience, um, continues to uh, work on behalf of Scotland. Uh, that, that last asset in there, which is very seldom referred to, is really important. With all the debate about this, uh, can I say to you, Mr Baird, with all the debate about this, uh, and all the criticisms that have come in a variety of directions, I have yet to hear, and I don't think I will hear, criticism of the expertise and expert base uh, of the team that you have. That is the asset, the most precious asset, that needs to be carried forward. What I'm trying to find out is how that can be best carried forward, dug into local communities, so that it actually is even more effective. I think yeah. the example you use, and, and Brian Swinbank was, has given evidence to the committee, is about community capacity and the appetite and the skill set. Uh, Tobermory is on phase, planning phase five and phase six. Been a really good long-term working relationship with, with the Crown Estate team and, and managing agents and, and with Brian. And I think to make sure that that, whatever structure, wh whatever decisions are made about structure, shows that that is open for business for communities who have got well-considered plans to come forward. Um, we engage with a lot of communities at different stages, right from the micro idea to the fully fledged business plan. Mull and Iona um, Community Development Trust handed us a fully thought through peer research document last night that my team are busy looking at this morning. And that's a pleasure. It's genuinely a pleasure. And, and uh, Morvan from the trust there was here last night, the cross party group, because we met with her at the Community Land Scotland AGM and um, one of our uh, other stakeholders from Storrs Uist said, if you're entertaining the start of this project, you must speak to Paul Banks and, and the team at the Crown Estate because they helped us on our project. And that openness for business and local management agreements in, in your constituency in GIA, um, you know, it was a very clear, quick win there when the community said, we've got an idea and we need help to develop it forward. And, and, and to my mind, as long as that open for business engagement with communities who have ideas, right from the micro idea to the fully fledged business plan is there, with good communities, with good capacity and ideas, things will happen. And, and there's lots, lots of going on in legislative process with community empowerment, et cetera, that will enable that to happen as well. And I think just make sure that when all those things hit organisations and requests, that they're, they're open to do those, the opportunities are there to be taken. Thank you. Um, Sarah Boyer. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the community empowerment bill earlier, and I think that's a, a good point to make, that we have new powers and, and a new energy going for supporting communities. Um, and it really follows on from Mike Russell's point there about having a mix of the national expertise being completely available locally, um, but also having that bottom-up access to new resources. And I, th I think that's what we're looking for. And the point that Dave Thompson made about hybrid at the start, I think was very good, um, that it's, not, it's neither a, a national organisation we want, nor everything necessarily at the local levels, actually combining both. And I think some thought needs to be given to that as you think about how the powers are transferred and how the, how the expertise is retained. I think that was something everybody in the committee was keen to see. At that point, um, uh, Alec Ferguson and another issue related to... Uh, thank you, Convener. It's really, really to follow up the, the point that um, uh, Gareth Baird quite rightly made that the, one of the biggest assets of the Crown Estate is, is the, the expertise that it has and the people that it employs, the staff base that, that is there. And it's, it's really a sort of practical question, really. Is it possible to, to say how many of the staff work on Scotland-only Crown Estate issues and how many work across the UK? And, and I guess the, the, you know, the follow-up to that is what are the staff implications of, of, of the possible devolution of Crown Estate? Uh, well, we have 38 people in the Bellsbury office in Edinburgh. Um, at the, um, we are obviously directly involved in Scotland. Now, I know from the energy and infrastructure side, uh, there's a huge uh, resource that um, comes up from our headquarters at New Billington Place. Ronnie, you might like to comment on that. Yes, I mean, the, up until now, the energy and infrastructure uh, portfolio within the Crown State has been managed on a functional basis rather than a geographic basis. So I've got, for example, UK responsibilities for ocean energy. Other, other people in Bellsbury have got um, UK responsibilities uh, and, and vice versa with, with regard to New Billington Place. Um, 
within, within energy infrastructure in Edinburgh, we have about 12, 13 staff, but we pull on um, a significant resource in New Wellington Place. And, and while there is a large degree of uncertainty about what new business model or uh, direction will be taken, um, we are trying to identify how best we can draw on and identify assets within uh, the wider Crown Estate that can be transferred. That, that's not complete and will uh, depend largely on how, how the Scottish Government want to take this further forward uh, and how they want that resourced. Okay. Just to add a, a legal overlay, if I may, the draft of the Scotland Bill at the moment has a very clear statement in it that says that the sorts of people that we're talking about, the fine staff of Bell's Bray, will be protected in connection with this and that they, they won't um, have their terms and conditions um, impacted upon by virtue of the transfer. And I think we are anticipating that, as at the point that the transfer takes place, it will incorporate the sorts of protections you'd see in 2P or COSOP, which yeah. are legal yeah. mechanisms to make sure that people who are in scope who deliver their activities into Scotland um, are effectively protected and transferred as at that point in time. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, thinking about the Scotland Bill as such, um, you must have played some role as a commissioner, as staff, as lawyers in the development of the clauses. I'd be just interested to see how much you have been consulted or have been involved in the process of the creation of the clauses that we have before us now? I mean, uh, the, the starting point in relation to that question is to say that obviously the bill itself was drafted by Parliamentary Council on the instructions of um, Cabinet Office and Treasury. We have played a role along with other interested stakeholders in relation to Clause 31 specifically in ensuring that decisions that are being made are being made in a way that is informed, that is aware of what we are as an entity, and to ensure that all of the technical um, description of the complexity of us as an organisation, which we've spoken to already, um, is being worked into and recognised in the approach that they're taking. Have you had uh, any dealings with the Scottish Government at, uh, during this process? I've had no direct involvement with the Scottish Government in relation to the legal aspects of it, which is probably reflective of the fact that we're one beneath where that conversation is taking place. We're a stakeholder who is informing. Our Scottish Government focus to date has very much been on the practical. It's very much the, the good work that Ronnie and Alan and the team are doing in relation to engaging with their counterparts within Scottish Government to focus on transition, transparency and clarity on that process. So, so the Commissioners presumably have been dealing uh, directly with the Treasury then uh, in the process of cre the creation of this uh, these set of clauses? We inform Treasury, yes. And the Commissioner, have you been uh, involved uh, uh, in the no, processes? No. So it's not been at your level either? Uh, I think we've been informed about, uh, about the progress of the process. Um, but uh, as Rob said, you know, our major job here is to inform both governments about, about the Scottish assets, about the complexity of them and how to, um, uh, just so that they make their decisions on the back of that. Okay, fine, thank you. Mike Russell? Yeah, can I just be clear about that? Uh, you said you had had the organisation, Mr Booth, at your level, had had no contact with the Scottish Government about the detail of this. In relation specifically to the drafting of yes, the Scotland Bill? Yes, specific, specifically I, to the legislation. I, I think that's right. I don't what think is your finish. level? My level yeah. is the technical. It's providing it's, it's technical a technical input. level. Do you work in London? Or? I do work in London, so, yes. So at a technical level in London, any contact that you have had about the drafting of Section 31 of the Scotland Act has been with the UK government, with the Treasury? Yes. But not with the Scottish government? No. OK. Jim? Thank you, Kavina. Has at any point the Scottish government contacted uh, yourself regarding the Scotland Bill? Speaking for yeah. myself, no, not personally. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, we've uh, run round a lot of the houses. 
We've looked at baskets that are not basket cases, <laughs> I'm glad to say. We've looked at the whole interests that the Crown Estate in Scotland has in a very, uh, uh, you know, positive, I hope, sort of view. We obviously are interested in teasing out how we can actually transfer the assets easily and make sure that they work. And uh, I think you've given us answers that help us along that line. Thank you as witnesses. Um, it's been very good of you to uh, be here and I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in future, hopefully as a process is accelerated and we get on with the job of actually uh, earning money and uh, developing the economy. So thank you very much, all of you. Just now, we'll take a short recess.
so we'll continue with agenda item two and welcome back to meeting everyone. I'll continue to take evidence on the proposed devolution of the Crown Estate assets and welcome the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Rural Affairs, Food and Environment, Richard Lockhead, Linda Rossborough, Director of Marine Scotland and David Mallon, Head of Marine Environment, uh, Scottish Government. Good morning to you all. Um, I'd like to kick off a question about this, uh, considering, if you can, any meetings that there have been between the Crown Estate and the Scottish Government and between the Scottish Government and the UK Treasury on the issue of the devolution since the Smith Commission uh, reported. Have there been any tripartite meetings or have there been any bilaterals? Uh, there have been several meetings, clearly, <coughs> both in the context of uh, colleagues alongside me who have been dealing with the Crown Estate directly over uh, a long time, and of course at Deputy First Minister and First Minister level with uh, the UK Government over the wider context of the Smith Commission of which the Crown Estate Revolution uh, is a, a key part. So many of the meetings so far have been at official level, but clearly the Deputy First Minister is engaged directly as is the First Minister. Well, it seems as though the Scotland Bill has not taken on board any of the recommendations by the Devolution Further Powers Committee report. Whilst this may be a timing issue, members you know, here are concerned and we'd like to explore what the government's view is. Do you believe that the Scot Scotland Bill delivers the Smith Commission outcomes in relation to the Crown Estate? Well, no, I don't. And... What I'd like to say is the, there are a number of complex issues posed by the devolution of the administration of the Crown Estate, and the Scottish Government has made a clear case for the devolution of the administration of the Crown Estate in Scotland, uh, and of course that's been supported by the Scottish Parliament, but most importantly that's also something supported, uh, I believe, by the people of Scotland in order to promote accountability, transparency and to prevent the leakage of valuable revenues from Scotland to the UK Treasury. And what the people of Scotland, I think, expect from the, the Smith Commission's proposal is that we'll modernise the management of our key assets to ensure they deliver benefits for our country and are managed in the public interest. And whilst we're pleased, of course, that the Smith Commission recommends a transfer of the Crown Estate Management Revenues to the Scottish Parliament, I have to say, in response to your question, unfortunately, the Scotland Bill goes against the spirit and intention of the Smith Commission proposals. I honestly believe we've been presented with a dog's breakfast by the UK Government. It's too complicated and includes legislation on reserved activities that, in the terms of the Smith Agreement, should be for memorandums of understanding. It also limits the ability of the Scottish Parliament to establish a completely new framework in some of the areas where we want to do that in relation to the Crown Estate assets. So clearly we don't believe the proposals below us are anywhere near satisfactory and they do go against the spirit and intention of the Smith Commission. Jim Hume. Yeah, thank you, Convener. You, you seem dissatisfied with the uh, with the Scotland Bill and, and the way it's going forward. We've just heard from Rob Booth, Head of Legal from the Crown Estate, who has, uh, in his own, own words, been working with the, the UK Government on, on, on that bill and devolution for the, for, with regard to further devolution of the Crown Estate. I asked him the question, if the Scottish Government, if yourself, had been in, in touch with him, himself or, or, or themselves, the legal, and uh, he said no. I just wonder, why not? Well, clearly, uh, the Crown Estate... Uh, are in regular meetings with the Scottish Government at official level. Uh, the question I think that's more appropriate is whether the UK Government and the Scottish Government are speaking to each other about the Smith Commission. This is about negotiation uh, to fulfil what was promised by the Smith Commission was expected to be delivered through those proposals. Therefore, the conversations over the future of the Crown Estate in Scotland are clearly between the UK Government and the Scottish Government. These conversations and negotiations are taking place at the highest level, with the Crown Estate's future being at the heart of these negotiations. So clearly the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, who I think is again about to meet to the, the Crown Estate shortly, uh, have been at the heart of these negotiations, and that's the right and proper level where they should take place. The Crown Estate clearly are non-political and have a job to do in terms of the management of the assets. The negotiations and discussions over devolution are between the two governments. 
So, so, the, so therefore, you, you're stating it would, it would have been inappropriate for the Scottish Government to discuss with uh, the, legal, uh, the legal team at Crown Estates regarding the Scotland Bill and what, what yourselves would want in that? Well, with all due respect, I do think that's a bit of a red herring because this is a discussion and a negotiation between two governments, the Scottish Government and the UK Government in relation to the Scotland Bill going before the House of Commons, which we want to deliver what was promised and agreed in the Smith Commission. And that's the right and proper place for these discussions to take place. As I said before, there are many, many meetings between all the various teams within the Crown Estates over the devolution of the Crown Estate between officials and Crown Estate uh, officials, but the, clearly the negotiations are at ministerial level. Okay, thanks. And Mike Russell. Yes, um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. A, uh, Clause 31, subparagraph 7 um, of the Scotland uh, Bill uh, gives the Scottish Government the opportunity to put in place a scheme of um, activity or uh, management for the Crown Estate in Scotland if it chooses to do so, um, according to Mr Booth again, uh, prior to uh, the devolution of the Crown Estate coming into place. And Mr Booth's argument, and I raised with him the question of this absolutely monumental <coughs> complexity of this uh, clause, which is utterly unnecessary, I think, in most reasonable people's opinion. Um, he, and his answer was to draw attention to 31.7, to say that the Scottish Government was now entirely free to put in place its own arrangements. Has the uh, Scottish Government started the process of putting in place some drafting for a scheme of arrangement after um, the devolution of the management of the Crown Estate has taken place? The focus of the negotiations with the UK Government just now are over the draft clauses that we have put forward as a Scottish Government for the devolution of the Crown Estate to make it more simple and more effective and to deliver what was promised with the Smith Commission proposals. And therefore, that is the negotiation that is taking place right now, as we believe the very simple tabling of the amendment to be agreed, hopefully, by the UK Government of removing the reservation over the management of Crown Estate assets is the simplest and easy way to devolve uh, that responsibility to the Scottish Parliament. The clauses that Michael Russell refers to, as he referred to himself as monumentally complex, uh, clearly should be replaced with more simpler clauses, and that's our focus of the negotiations at the moment. Except that if there, this, that does not take place, then essentially what will happen is that some of the things that are presently not subject to the Crown Estate legislation of, of 1961 become subject to that legislation. For example, payments into the Consolidated Fund, a whole range of matters become subject to uh, legislation which is not presently, it's writ, does not run in Scotland um, for certain things. And that will actually make the situation worse rather than better in certain circumstances. Um, with that in mind, presumably you have, I'm sorry to use these terms, a plan A, B and C in order to ensure that those who are affected are not adversely affected? Well, clearly there's various stages of the negotiations taking place, and you're right, we'll have to respond to each stage as we enter that stage of negotiation. But the stage we're at just now is the fact that we have within the UK government's clauses a very complex arrangement that does not devolve the management of the Crown Estate assets in Scotland. And there are potential complexities that would indeed make things worse because if you look at the restrictions that are placed upon devolution by the UK government's current proposals, there are so many checks and balances and restrictions and carve-outs built in to what is being proposed that it does not amount to anywhere near what we would regard as the spirit and intention of the Smith Commission, that is the proper and full devolution of the management of the Crown State in Scotland. So you will be ready for any eventuality, as I know you always are. I'm sure we'll be ready for any eventuality, but we're trying to prevent some occurring in the first place. Well, <laughs> certainly, yes, sir. I have a brief yeah, supplementary okay. to that particular question, because, because could I go back... Come on a second. Good morning. Well, apologies. Morning. Um, could I go back to the point that Mr Russell made uh, when referring to what Mr Booth had said, uh, told us in the last session about the ability of the Scottish Government to put in place a structure... Um, to allow effective management, as I understand it, of Crown Estate assets. Uh, 
uh, before the transfer takes place. And, and with respect, I don't think you answered his part of that question, because it seems to me, whatever the complexities that exist, uh, which will hopefully be ironed out, I don't know what the chances of that happening are, but you know, one, one hopes for the best. Um, but it seems to me somewhat irresponsible if the Scottish Government has not already be begun to look at what it has the power to do before transfer, um, if it's not to be caught on the back foot when that transfer actually comes. Okay, well, clearly I, I wasn't uh, there to hear the evidence given to the Crown Estate, and I'll reflect upon what they said to the committee. Uh, and there's a lot of work taking place between the Crown Estate, the Scottish Government, but as the negotiations are taking place between the Scottish Government and the UK Government over the scale of the devolution of the Crown Estate. Of course, within the existing clauses in the UK Government, there is some devolution over the management of the Crown Estate's assets in Scotland. The key point from the Scottish Government's point of view, which I, I believe is a key point supported by the people of Scotland, is its partial devolution of the Crown Estate to Scotland. And that is not what was agreed within the Smith Commission or what is expected by the people of Scotland. So yes, there are some proposals there, of course, that give us some more devolution, because we don't have any devolution in the Crown Estate at the moment, uh, and that uh, is certainly the case. But we can't accept partial devolution of the Crown Estate assets. There are so many powers within the draft clauses to give powers to the Treasury, to give powers of direction, to add in further restrictions over and above those already within the draft clauses. And therefore, you know, everywhere we turn, there's more checks and balances and restrictions on what's actually devolved to Scotland. May I, one final point, Kavita. I, I, I accept that, and I, uh, well, I accept your arguments. Um, and I accept also that that is for negotiation between government and government. <coughs> but as a member of this committee, uh, I am slightly concerned that if, if there exists a power, or if there will exist a power for the Scottish Government to act to uh, remove some of the uh, criteria and constrictions that, that have been talked about, um, I, I am quite concerned as a member of this committee that the Scottish Government doesn't appear to be exploring the potential that exists within that at this point in time. <clears throat> we have discussions taking place with the Crown Estate over the operation of the Crown Estate in Scotland, irrespective of the scenarios. But what I'm trying to explain here is that our absolute focus is on a very clear chain of events that are taking place in relation to the evolution of the Crown Estate. We have the debate over the uh, Scotland Bill going through the UK Parliament at the current time. Our absolute focus is to make sure those deliver the Smith Commission proposals. That's the absolute focus for these subsequent weeks. Uh, thereafter, uh, we will then have a Scotland Bill agreed. Uh, and prior to that, uh, I should say to the committee that within a matter of uh, the next few weeks, I intend to set up a stakeholder forum in Scotland with all relevant parties to look at uh, the interim steps we'd want to put in place to give continuity and stability in Scotland as the transfer uh, is uh, prepared. And then, of course, we'll have to look at what the overall framework and model will be for a Scottish uh, organisation in due course. So there has to be interim arrangements put in place whilst we await the legislation to go through the House of Commons giving the final devolution of the Crown Estate to Scotland. Okay, thank you. I, I think Claudia we'll be coming to some of those aspects later anyway. Yes, I guess so. Claudia yes. Beamish. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and, morning. and uh, to colleagues. Um, I, I raise this issue which has now been pursued with, with you um, uh, by Mike Russell and by Alec Ferguson um, earlier with the Crown Estate. And you will be aware that the, um, even if the assets are transferred um, or the management is transferred to local government level and or to communities, that the income, um, as things stand, would still go back to the Crown Estates. And I think it would be very helpful if we could understand, if not today, then from, from yourself um, in the near future, um, what the timescales are likely to be in terms of the possibility of bringing forward Scottish Government legislation prior to um, the enactment of the Scotland Bill in, in order to appropriately take forward the issues that have been raised this morning. And I wonder if you can highlight um, when we might be able to hear what that possibility will be, because there is a serious concern about if, if that doesn't happen, um, where we will be left with the, the Scottish Consolidated Fund and with a range of other complex issues? 
Uh, clearly, we're seeking clarity from the UK government on the impact on the consolidated fund. And at the point of transfer, we do, of course, expect the consolidated fund to be affected at the point of transfer in terms of the revenues from the Crown Estate in Scotland. Thereafter, we'll have to just pin that down and make sure we've got absolute clarity as to what happens with future revenues. Uh, in terms of the timetable, uh, clearly we have an expectation that in early 2016 the process will be completed for the Scotland Bill and thereafter there will have to be secondary legislation we expect uh, and that you know, we expect will be relatively soon thereafter but I, I can't sit here and give a date because it's all in the hands of the, uh, the legislative process in the House of Commons. Uh, and thereafter, you're quite right, that would give us an ability to put forward legislation in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, Standing as Cabinet Secretary, that, uh, from the evidence earlier today, that uh, there, there could be the possibility of um, legislation in the Scottish Parliament so that things be, are more seamless before the, the Act comes into, um, if, if, if it does in, indeed go forward, the Scotland um, Bill to become an Act, so that so that we don't present difficulties for the people of Scotland um, in, in the transfer process. Uh, well, well, that's right. I, mean, I referred to, in response to Alec Ferguson's question, the fact we do need an interim stage in this process, because there will be long-term decisions that will be taken in Scotland over the management of the Crown Estate's assets in Scotland. There has to be an interim stage. We want the transfer of the Crown Estate as an, a going concern, an, an entity, to give stability and continuity. And as that stage takes place, uh, as I said, we're going to set up a stakeholder forum within a few weeks. And if there are some issues that have to be addressed through amendments to the 1961 Act, through the powers you refer to, we would do that as an interim measure. Perhaps to change the remit of the Crown Estate slightly in Scotland, or whatever that may be. Whilst we, in Parliament, go through the process of long-term decisions over how to manage the assets in Scotland. But from a point of view of giving continuity and stability to business, in Scotland, particularly the offshore renewable sector, we do need that interim step. And yes, you're right, we would potentially use the ability to amend the 61 Act to make some adjustments to the Crown Estate's functions in Scotland. But we still want it to be an entity and a going concern there will be still a Crown Estate in Scotland. Thank you. Uh, reverting to the actual Scotland Bill at the present time, what amendments does the Scottish Government think are necessary to this uh, Bill? to make your case? Well, as I, as I said in response to Michael Russell at the beginning, the, we are proposing removing the reservation in relation to the Crown Estate in Scotland. That's the simplest, clearest way to devolve uh, that responsibility to the Scottish Parliament. I, I also refer in my answer that what we have before us just now is a dog's breakfast full of restrictions, full of uh, powers that are left with the UK Secretary of States uh, and also with various carve-outs. In other words, some issues that should be devolved to Scotland, which we believe are assets in this country, uh, would still remain a reserve power. Uh, so therefore, the only way around that is to be clear-cut and to remove the reservation. Yeah, We'll probably come to some of these economic yeah. assets in, in, in the near future, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, Angus MacDonald, you've got a question, I think, about stakeholder interests. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, we, we heard from a few stakeholders previously that um, there are some concerns regarding the transition period. Um, what's the Scottish Government doing to, to reassure uh, Crown State stakeholders uh, through the period of, or this period of transition? Well, clearly we do share some of those concerns, and that's why we think it's absolutely vital as an interim stage However long that will be in place for, we certainly need it, and it will be a considerable amount of time. Uh, we have a number of staff based in Scotland, and they are doing a job at the moment in terms of managing the assets in, in this country. We also have staff in London who are part of the Crown Estate but work on Scottish issues. So clearly there's discussions taking place just now on what happens in relation to the roles based outside of Scotland that work on Scottish assets. And we, ha we have to come up with a solution because we want continuity for the foreseeable future to give that stability to business and communities. <coughs> so that interim stage is very important. So are there any plans to engage with uh, stakeholders? For example, we heard from uh, the tenants at uh, uh, the Liberty State um, who, who had some concerns. Is, is, there, 
Is there any engagement process planned uh, during the transition period? Uh, it so happens I met about 70 tenant farmers in my constituency from the <laughs> Crown Estate uh, Rural Estate, so I'm well aware of their, their views on this issue. Uh, however, what I will be announcing in a matter of weeks is a forum of all the relevant people who have got an interest in the future of the Crown Estate assets in this country, particularly the business community and the, the communities themselves. And therefore, I will hear at first hand their views on the way forward. It's my intention to set that up soon. And then, within a few weeks, we may hopefully have a slightly better idea of the direction of travel in terms of devolution. Uh, and we will then begin to discuss uh, their concerns and making sure we address them and how we can have the Crown Estate continuing uh, as an entity in Scotland and as a going concern to provide that continuity. Okay, thank you. And um, what plans do you have to ensure? that the voices of stakeholders across the onshore and offshore interests uh, of the Crown Estate will continue to be heard? Well, clearly I would want to involve them uh, and the representatives in the forum, but my message to them is that we absolutely recognise the need for continuity and certainty, and that's why we will minimise disruption in the foreseeable future and to understand the long-term direction of travel for how to manage the estates and the public interest uh, in Scotland. Okay, I'm, I'm sure I will give him some comfort. Thank you. Um, Sarah Boyack, uh, the economic assets that have been touched on, I think. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, we took evidence earlier this morning about the whole issue of economic estates um, and assets, and you were um, just talking there about um, there are reservations and carve-outs. I'm wondering what your view is on the, the issue of economic asset transfer from the Crown Estates. Uh, Okay, I just want to make sure I understand your terminology correctly in terms of economic assets, just the general economic assets of the... Well, particular view on Fort Canary. Yes, I, okay, I thought you might be going there. Well, needless to say, and I, I would expect the committee would share some of my concerns here, is that we're very unhappy with the definition of the Scottish assets that would be transferred under devolution. You could be forgiven for thinking there's some kind of exercise here in concealing assets so they don't have to be transferred to Scotland. Uh, it's our view that Fort Conaird is a Scottish asset and therefore should be included in those assets that are transferred through devolution. Uh, and we are unhappy with the uh, complicated arrangements that appear to be in place that seem to be used as a hook to define that as not a Scottish asset. Uh, my understanding is our sh the Crown Estate share of the Fort Conaird um, assets is around £100 million, perhaps generating about £30 million of revenues in the last eight years or so. These are our estimates. I can't guarantee there's the exact figures because you'd have to get them from the, the Crown Estate, which is not always easy due to lack of transparency in some of these issues. However, that is a substantial asset and it should be included in the devolution of the assets to Scotland. And if I can just give you one supplementary point there. One reason why that's quite important is you may want to ask questions on cross-subsidy between different assets within the, the Crown Estate Scottish portfolio. And clearly, if a major asset like Fort Conaird was taken out of the Scottish basket of assets, that removes you know, a major source of income that could otherwise help in terms of the plans for the future of managing the estates in Scotland. I think we do need a bit more information in the detail. Um, Jim, you asked a question about UK... Uh, transfers to Scotland earlier, and I think it would be useful to get that information. I did ask one of the Crown Estate officials in the margin to the meetings for the detail on the Fort Canaird issue so that we could actually see the numbers in front of us. So, as I understand it, you're right, Cabinet Secretary, it's part owned by um, an English limited partnership, which the Crown Estate has an interest in, and the other half is owned by a Jersey-based unit trust. So it would actually be interesting to get some more detail on this. Have you had those discussions with either the Crown Estate or the UK Government to date? We are feeding that issue in amongst many other issues, uh, so it has been raised, uh, and we will continue to raise it. Okay, thank you, Convener. Thank you. Mike Russell? Yeah, it's just quite important to, to, to put this on the record. Uh, not least because a historical perspective is sometimes quite good. You will recall, I think, that at the time of devolution, when the original assets of the Crown Estate were passed to the Scottish Parliament, a number were left untransferred, including a sizable piece of ground in, near Stirling, uh, including in the environs of Stirling Castle, and what might be best called a ransom strip. 
in Princes Street Gardens. And it took a very considerable time, effort. In the case of Stirling, I believe quite substantial sums of money to resolve the issue. Um, I think we are back again at this extraordinary reluctance of the Crown Estate or whoever is responsible for the Crown Estate. And the Treasury looms large in all the drafts of the, uh, the, the clauses that one has seen, uh, essentially trying to hold on to as much as possible. And people should recognise that this is a modus operandi when we're discussing the Crown Estate in Scotland. I think that's a fair summary of uh, perhaps what we're facing at the moment. And clearly, I think it's unreasonable for the Crown Estate to start categorising Scottish assets into different groupings because of different financial arrangements. Um, definitions that it some of which are Scottish and some of which are not exactly. Scottish, despite the fact they're in Scotland. Indeed. So clearly, I think from the public interest point of view, and I think the public of Scotland would expect this, is that the Crown Estate's activities in Scotland should be devolved. Is there a case for looking at the uh, Limited Partnerships Act of 1907, under which this partnership structure of the Crown Estate and Gibraltar Holdings, or whatever it is, uh, has been laid to have a, a version of that in Scotland or to, to see part of that act looked at in terms of uh, the asset that uh, has been created under it. I respect your knowledge of the 1907 <laughs> legislation and therefore have no reason to question the point you make, convener. Uh, however, I do believe that you know, we should have a rational negotiation with the UK government here and these games are unhelpful. We should not have to fight for every inch of devolution when it comes to something that was agreed in the Smith Commission. Indeed. Partnerships Act of 1907 to know when somebody is at it. Mm, indeed. But at least it's more recent than the Battle of the Standard, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> which we dealt with in another context in this committee with the Cabinet Secretary. Indeed. But uh, the views on that are perfectly clear. Uh, further on this point, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, could we, um, as a committee, explore a bit further what the Scottish Government's view is on the proposal that the Crown Estate will be able to invest in Scotland after the scheme for transfer um, has been exercised and that revenues generated from such activities will flow to the UK Treasury? Well, our view on that issue is that whilst we clearly cannot prevent anybody outside of Scotland investing in Scotland. For the purposes of our negotiations with the UK government, we think it would be far simpler that the Crown Estate in Scotland is the Crown Estate body that's active in Scotland and the remaining Crown Estate for the rest of the UK is active in the rest of the UK. And that is clear cut and that is proper devolution. So we clearly, as I said before, we can't stop outside organisations investing in Scotland. We want to do that. But in terms of negotiation over a UK body, part of which has been devolved, we think it's right and proper that the activities of each body are restrained to the administration in which they work. Right, thank you. And there, there have been um, arguments put forward by the Crown Estate in previous evidence and in previous years that we've, we've taken about, uh, for instance, the issue around um, marine renewables, that a lot of investment has come from other parts of the UK into, um, into Scotland um, for for that purpose, and I wonder where that would sit. I'm, I'm, I'm listening carefully to your answer already, but just for sort of some sort of clarification on a Scottish Government view on, on money coming in from other parts of the UK, from the Crown Estate, um, to support um, activity here. Well, clearly the current arrangements are that the revenues from Scotland go into the, the UK Treasury and therefore any subsidy that comes back again, it clearly is funding that's gone from Scotland in the first place. It, it's quite difficult to untie that, as you can imagine, because there's, oh, over the years, there's been quite a lack of transparency with the Crown Estate's finances and, and, and their arrangements. So it's difficult to give answers on these issues. One of the reasons why we do want devolution of the Crown Estate is to give that transparency and accountability that's not there just now. So. There will be all kinds of complicated arrangements, but what we do know at the moment is that Scotland pays a surplus from Scotland, from our assets, into the, the UK Treasury, and clearly under devolution that would stay in Scotland. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say we don't want to cooperate, of course, if the Crown Estate in Scotland and the Crown Estate and the rest of the UK 
wish to cooperate or work together on certain issues, there may be a case for that. But in terms of the actual arrangements put in place for devolution, it's important that the activities of the Crown Estate in Scotland are focused on Scotland and the rest of the UK's Crown Estates focus the rest of the UK. I, I understand and res respect what you're saying. Um, I just recall from previous years the argument made by the Crown Estates that to kick-start certain industries, such as the offshore renewables, that money was bought in from other parts of the UK, um, from the Crown Estate um, assets. And yeah. it, I'm, <coughs> I'm just trying to sort sure. of tease that out further. Well, well, that's an argument that's perhaps put forward by the Crown Estate of the mm -hmm. UK government, but it's an argument which we'd like to see backed up with all the relevant figures yeah. of what Scotland's paid into the pot over mm -hmm. many, many years, because mm -hmm. the accounts only go back a few years. But we've had the Crown Estate for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, until the, those making that argument give us the exact accounts and financial arrangements that have been in place, where the money's come from, where it's been invested, going back many, many years, we can't really answer that argument properly. Thank you. Okay. I think we'll move on to the transfer of management now. Christian Allard. Thank you very much, Governor. Good morning, it's still morning. Uh, first of all, Maybe ask the Cabinet Secretary about one of the points you said earlier on about the forum of stakeholders. Maybe it would be good for this committee to have a, 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 an idea how wide remedy will be and how may, uh, who, who will be the, the people involved the forum. in the forum. Well, clearly, I'm just giving thought to that just now, and I'll make an announcement in a matter of weeks as to who we will invite to the first stakeholder forum. And any ideas the committee have following your evidence session would be most welcome. There are some obvious stakeholders we want to speak to and we want to have input from. And the tenant farmers were mentioned, of which there are many on the rural estates, and also the offshore renewable sector and the various other organisations who have a very close link to existing activities of the Crown Estate in Scotland. Thanks very much for this. Now, regarding the transfer of management to Scottish ministers, uh, can you tell the committee uh, how the Scottish Government is ensuring that implementation of marine planning is uh, taking into account the management of the Crown Estate's marine assets? <coughs> the, the Crown Estates have had input in Scotland to marine planning, as far as I can recall. They've been a, a partner in that because of their obvious interest in the seabed. Uh, when it comes to the aquaculture, clearly local government has a lot of input into the, that issue as well. So marine planning is a partnership between all the various authorities, uh, whether it's the Crown Estate or local government or central government or, or whoever. Uh, so the Crown Estate have been involved in that process up to now. The marine plan is there and clearly Post-devolution, we would expect to look at the remit of the Crown Estate in Scotland. And as we review that, clearly a priority will be to support government policy and the public interest. Therefore, the marine plans that are in place in terms of the future use of our seas is something that all public authorities would be expected to support. And we would ensure that was a responsibility of the Crown Estate in Scotland. Yeah. Um, if I could make one technical point, um, we're discussing with the um, Crown Estate staff a number of um, operational issues, and one of which is the sort of Mars marine planning IT system. And um, we're looking across the whole <clears throat> IT spectrum to ensure that we've got an ability to continue to have IT operating as it fits with Crown Estate functions, which includes that capability around marine planning. That's, that's quite interesting. As Marine Scotland starting to to uh, to, uh, to to phase in some of this uh, partnership that we will have, of course, with uh, with the Crown Estates. Yes. Yeah. So clearly, devolution of the Crown Estate in Scotland means we have more influence over the remit of the Crown Estate in Scotland to take into account uh, the social and economic objectives of uh, the Scottish Government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave Thompson to follow on in that vein. Yeah, thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, <coughs> morning, Cabinet Secretary morning. and uh, colleagues. Um, it's obviously in everyone's interest to have, have a smooth transition, and uh, you already mentioned in relation to the question from Angus MacDonald there about the, the discussions with uh, the Glenlivet farmers in your, in your area. 
Um, what have you been doing in terms of discussing with the, the wider stakeholders, let's say aquaculture and the offshore renewables people, you know, to ensure that smooth transition? Well, we have done our best uh, through our discussions with them, communications with them, to give the signal that we very much recognise that we do want that smooth transition and we do recognise we'll have to take into account the impact on offshore renewables and the existing plans of any future arrangements put in place in Scotland post-evolution. Uh, so clearly that two-stage process I've referred to before is very important. There is having the entity of the Crown Estate in Scotland devolved to Scotland, that will continue as an entity, that will give the Parliament uh, and the Government the opportunity to properly map the future of how to manage that collection of assets in Scotland. Uh, we do not want to rush into this. Clearly there are some changes no doubt we can make rather quickly in terms of the remit of the Crown Estate in Scotland, but we, we have a, a situation with a collection of assets that come under the responsibility of the Crown Estate. So we have to carefully manage that going forward and not cause disruption that could damage business interests or, or Scotland's renewable energy ambitions or, or tenant farming uh, activities or whatever that may be. Supplementary? Yeah, supplementary, uh, thank you, convener. Not the next question? No. <laughs> I don't think I'm asking the next question, actually. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'm, I'm wondering um, whether there is consideration by Scottish Government about looking very specifically at the remit and aims of the, um, of the Crown Estate once or, or prior to, as appropriate, the, um, the transfer happens, because in past years, we, some of us in the committee have raised with the Crown Estate um, the possibility of looking at a, a wider social remit and an economic um, development remit, and I wonder what your view would, on that would be. Well, my view is that's a big opportunity, and of course, the people of Scotland, the Parliament, the Government don't just want devolution of the Crown Estate for the sake of it, it's because of wanting to do things differently and better and make sure that these assets are working for the public interest in this country. So clearly, one opportunity, as you quite rightly uh, raise, is looking at the remit of the Crown Estate in Scotland and the social and economic remit, and therefore that would be a priority. But it's important that debate takes place in Scotland and over the coming months we'll ensure that does happen. What I've tried to outline to the committee today is that it's absolutely vital we understand that we have to get proper devolution to enable that debate to properly take place. Otherwise, it will be uh, half-cocked in that we won't have all the powers we expected to have, therefore the debate won't be a proper debate. So we just have to persuade the UK Government, let's make this simple and clear and deliver what was promised by the Smith Commission and agreed to and signed up to, and then that debate will be a proper debate on what the role and functions of the Crown Estate in Scotland should be. Today, yeah. You, you expressed some concern earlier on, Cabinet Secretary, about just knowing exactly what was in the books, you know, and, and just uh, how much money comes and goes and, and just what the, the real bottom line is over a period of time. Given that there is some doubt about that, um, can you give assurances to both the onshore and the offshore interests that investment will be maintained into the future? Well, clearly, it's government policy to support that investment and to support offshore renewable activities. Therefore, we will use every avenue we have to to move that forward and make sure we can achieve renewable energy targets and take advantage of that massive resource we have. And that will apply to the Crown Estate in Scotland as it will to every other agency and government body involved in, in making offshore renewables a reality. That will be our policy direction. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, maybe just move on to um, ask you about the, the, the relationships that have been built up um, by the Crown Estate with local communities, local development trusts, private interests and so on, and, and how you see that moving on as the transfer occurs and will, that, will those uh, things be maintained? Well, as an example, 
when I met the 70 or so tenant farmers in my constituency, I know I'm speaking today as Cabinet Secretary, but I think it's very relevant, given that as uh, MSP I met uh, 70 tenant farmers on the Crown Estate land. Uh, as I said to them, you know, one big advantage of devolution is we will be able to ensure that they have direct input to their own futures. Of course, there are some good relationships out there, but I also know as a constituency MSP there have been some issues over a long period of time uh, with the Crown Estate as a landlord. Uh, I think some of these issues are better than perhaps were in the past, perhaps no doubt because change was seen on the horizon. <laughs> uh, so it's a big opportunity to have, whether it's a tenant farmer or whether it's commercial or business interests, to have more of a say over their own future. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, we're thinking about the transfer uh, of management to local authorities and others uh, in this section, and Jim Hume's going to lead on that. Thank you very much, Convener. I just wonder how the Scottish Government uh, sees the process of the further devolution to local authorities and communities uh, working and how long uh, that will t uh, may, <coughs> may take. Well, clear, clearly, again, as I said before, we envisage a two-stage process. Uh, one is to, the first stage is to ensure we have the transfer of the Crown Estate in Scotland uh, through devolution. And then the next stage will be to map out the framework in which that operates within Scotland and our future management of those assets. As you will know, it's government policy that we have already given a commitment to the islands in this country uh, that we would devolve uh, income out to 12 miles in terms of the seabed uh, and also control over the foreshore which is clearly a big issue for island authorities uh, with many ports and harbours. Uh, and that's part of the island's uh, agreement we have, uh, which has been well publicised. Uh, and over and above that, of course, we've also said to the coastal local authorities in Scotland that the income from the seabed would be passed to local authorities. Okay, uh, just on that very point, you, you mentioned the island authorities. I know that there's an actual amendment uh, to the Scotland Bill down, down at Westminster, which um, uh, states that the Treasury and Scottish ministers must agree a scheme transferring to the control of uh, each of the Shetland, uh, Orkney and Western Isle councils in the transfer date all the existing Scottish functions and rights of the commissioners relating to those parts of the Scottish zone surrounding each of the island authorities on the actual day of, of, of that devolution. Would that be something that the 56 uh, MP colleagues you have support? No, because our policy is to have the transfer of the Crown Estate to Scotland as an entity and then to devolve to local authorities. And there are still some discussions going on as to what other powers should be devolved to local authorities. Uh, we have given a commitment, as I said before, to the island authorities and the coastal authorities of certain powers. We don't want, de we don't want devolution to stop in the uh, Scottish Parliament. We want to go down to communities. Uh, and we want Scotland to have that debate of whether or not there should be more powers over and above those already pledged by the Scottish Government. But this should be a smooth, clear process. <sighs> devolved to Scotland, Scotland devolves to local authorities. And that should be a proper flow of devolution and a proper debate. I expect Alistair Carmichael would not have tabled that amendment uh, if it had been a Liberal Democrat government in Scotland. <laughs> so uh, I think let's just be frank there. Uh, so we welcome, of course, any support for devolving to local authorities. It's something we're already committed to, but we believe in a very smooth process to get there. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, that point okay. and then come back to your second question. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Mike Russell. Yes, on the point of devolution to island, islands and island authorities, um, obviously there are commitments that have been entered into, uh, but there is also the issue of ability and expertise. Uh, Shetland Islands Council, for example, uh, you know, is involved in marine spatial planning, has been one of the first authorities to take those responsibilities on, has developed uh, an expertise which everybody admits uh, works pretty well. Um, uh, other authorities, like the authority in Argyll and Butte, has no such expertise, whereas there is substantial expertise uh, within the Crown Estate itself. However, at local level in Argyll, for example, in Tobermory in the Harbour Association, is substantial ability and a, and a track record of working with um, the Crown Estate. So, presumably, there is a flexibility about that next stage. 
that where it is to the benefit of the coastal communities, where it is to the benefit um, of those who are involved and to, the, to, to, to wider Scotland, uh, then that would be the right way to go forward, rather than to have a doctrinaire view of this matter, which would say, for example, devolution to every affected local authority, which would end up with a complete guddle in some places. I couldn't have said it better myself. I think Michael Russell has just summed up exactly why we have to be careful in how we move forward here. But we have our aspiration to devolve further to local communities and local authorities, and we'll certainly deliver that. But as Michael Russell quite rightly says, uh, Scotland is a very diverse country with diverse coastlines, and we may need flexibility, and there may be different levels of demand in different parts of the country for devolved powers. So it's much better to put in place a flexible system than preempt the devolution of the Crown Estate to Scotland. Okay, thank you. Uh, and back to your second question, Jim. Uh, uh, thanks very much, convener. Yes, it's, it's just regarding. Um, really what the Scot Scottish Government's view is on the assertion that providing lease-giving powers to local author authorities may replicate a historic position with the, in the Crown Estate in the past, where the, that authority may be the planning authority, but also the authority that will make money from leases. In other words, they'll have a... Uh, regarding aquaculture, of course. Well, as I said, you know, clearly the second stage of the evolution of the Crown Estate has to be mapping out the framework in which the Crown Estate operates, and also that will include further devolution to local communities and local authorities where appropriate. The seabed is clearly a strategic asset for Scotland, and we have to be careful about how that is managed and what powers are devolved in relation to that. What we, of course, have said is the income generated from that seabed out to 12 miles, the net income, uh, there's a good case for that to be devolved to, to local authorities. So. There's still a debate to be had over what other powers are relevant or appropriate. And you know, that's, that's the benefit of having devolution in the Crown Estate. We can actually have that debate for the first time because we will have the power in this Parliament to devolve where appropriate. So that's a very important part of the debate that you highlight. But you know, I think it's premature to take decisions at the moment on leasing, who's responsible for that or otherwise, and taking all these decisions at the moment. OK, thanks. But uh, good to note it at this point. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, and I think we'll look at the retention of expertise now with Alec Ferguson. Um, yes, thank you. In his own right. It's, it's really a question I, I put to the Crown Estate as well in the, in the last session. It arises out of the two stakeholder sessions we had earlier, um, at which we were given a very positive view of all stakeholders, I think it would be fair to say, relationship with the Crown Estate. And I, I think, as I said in the previous session, it really stems from for two reasons. Firstly, is the ability, and this particularly related to um, the marine sector, I think, of having one entity to deal with in the Crown Estate, uh, an entity that they were used to dealing with, and so the relationships been built up over a number of years. Um, but the other thing was the retention, of, was the high level of expertise that is available within the Crown Estate. Um, and out of that, you know, some witnesses were suggesting that there are some functions, such as, for instance, uh, management of offshore renewable energy um, and, indeed, research um, that might be better retained at a national level. So just I was really wondering what the Scottish Government's view of retaining that expertise is and how you can do that while devolving to the islands, while devolving to some local authorities. You know, how, how do you go about retaining that, the positive sides of the Crown Estate that, that have been highlighted to us? Well, you've highlighted one of the very practical challenges we do face, and we do recognise it's very important to maintain that expertise in the Crown Estate and at that high level. So it's certainly an objective to ensure we do what we can to retain that expertise. And that's why we're giving as much certainty as we can just now to the Crown Estate staff themselves by saying our support is there for the Crown Estate as an entity to remain in Scotland through the whole transfer process and for the foreseeable future. Uh, and therefore, uh, we want to give that certainty and continuity to the staff themselves. There is, of course, an issue in that some of the staff are based outside of Scotland who deal with Scottish issues and ha who have that expertise. So part of our discussions just now and our negotiations will clearly have to be to, to address that and seek, where appropriate, transfers of staff or whatever there are other solutions identified. So we very much value that and we recognise why business and the various sectors who rely on that expertise would also want to see that continuity. 
but you, you would be optimistic that a structure can be achieved that allows further, de further devolution where required while retaining it, because further devolution is going to diminish the assets that come to the central body in whatever shape it might be. Um, and so you remain optimistic. You, you can retain all that expertise, retain that level of research, um, all that management expertise, while being able to devolve where appropriate as well. Or you could turn that in a set and say that devolution will enhance the assets and that we will, we will build up a proper uh, you know, bank of expertise in this country, given that we have the vast majority of the offshore renewable potential and therefore that expertise should have always been, in any case, based in Scotland. It was a decision by the Crown Estate to base those posts outside of Scotland, but now we'll have the opportunity to do what's right and base those posts in this country. So we'll build up, hopefully, the expertise even further and the asset here. I admire your optimism, Cabinet Secretary, and hope it's not misplaced. Indeed. Um, I think that uh, you know, covers the ground as we see it at the moment. Uh, we're well aware that uh, the processes in government in London mean that uh, there may be a very rapid uh, you know, matter of taking this through the committee stage and so on. If that's so, um, we don't know whether we'll be able to come back and question you question you again, but that might be necessary at the beginning of September. We'll have to see. In the meantime, uh, thank you very much for your evidence. Uh, we will proceed uh, to keep an eye on all of this because it is very complex and uh, we'd hope that it would be much simpler indeed. So, as agreed earlier, um, we will be going into private in a minute or two and at our next meeting, uh, that is tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. We'll be taking evidence from the EU Commissioner on Agriculture and Rural Development, Phil Hogan. I now close the public part of the meeting and ask the public gallery to be cleared. Thank you. <laughs>